I had to say. Harry. Wow. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, welcome to the third Sunday after Pentecost. Glad everyone is here. If you're visiting, uh, please know you're welcome. And I am reminded, I've reminded myself for some surprising reason, uh, was able to do that, that we will have the communion service today. Everyone's invited. So if you're here with us for the first time, you're invited as well. We are in, on our second Sunday morning in the church building uh, where we have considered, we consider masks to be optional for folks who are fully vaccinated. And uh, if you have not yet been vaccinated or two weeks after uh, your full vaccination, for many of us that was two shots, not all maybe, but we ask that you wear a mask if you have not been vaccinated. We're still trying uh, to respect some distancing, at least in our seating. I know last week, it, understandably, out in the narthex after service, um, our uh, formal social distancing uh, went all to heck, you know, because it, it was nice to be together and to be able to be a little more relaxed about things. But um, we're not out of the woods yet, folks, so let's, let's be careful. Um, let's appreciate our ability to have less restriction, but let's still be careful if we can, please. I want to express something I've said before about giving of the congregation. Um, so much appreciated through a tough year and a half, and this congregation has excelled and done wonderful things. We uh, need to continue remembering that in our tithes and offerings and be disciplined as we go forward. And on that note, I will give what I think is a final report on the uh, United Methodist Women's Rummage Sale and Bake Sale. I'll read what Darlene gave to me over the microphone because I know that folks folks at home watching service need to hear that clearer over the mic. So hold on a sec, darling. I had a total for the rummage portion, 2,385 and 25 cents. You're telling me that needs to be adjusted? Plus 20. Please say, maybe carry the same. Okay. <laughs> so 2,405 and 25 cents. All right. Now, that's just for the rummage part, which was big, big, big. That benefits domestic sexual abuse services. DASIS uses the Wesley House for its ministry, Action Ministries, United Methodist Community House, Hospice of Cass County, Cass County Court Appointed Special Advocates for Children, Helping Hands of Cass County. Darlene reminded me Cass County Cancer Service and the salvation make lives better. Wow. And then the bake sale portion was $816. And uh, yeah. That will be uh, retained by the congregation for special projects within our, within our uh, church community, the first church community. So I'm told of $3,221.25. There was a time I would never do math in public, you know. This is it's a big step for me. $3,221.25, that that is a good doubling, doubling of our last sale, correct? Wow. Okay. And on that note of generosity, the Feeding America Mobile Pantry uh, coordinated, I, I want to say, uh, Karen coordinated through Action Ministries, though it is a, it has its own identity, but you and Action, and you're all over the organizational work and holding it along, was last week, Thursday? Yes, okay, in Vandalia. First time the mobile pantry was in that site. 
and you folks f fed 70 households, uh, which comes out to 167 people, 70 households, 167 people, and uh, including many children, uh, many seniors, some military vets, and so forth. So, wow, there you go. All right. The other thing I want to say, and Jacob, did Jacob make it today? And I didn't get to talk with him. I'm sorry, Jacob. I'm, I'm told we have something called YouTube subscriptions for our services. I'll get with you, Jacob. I apologize for just thinking of it right now. We need another 28 or so official YouTube subscriptions, if I understand correctly, and then we get put into a higher category of services on YouTube where uh, Jacob Peters, who does our tech, then he has more, uh, we have a, a different level of options for our services online. And he gets more information reported to him so he can craft some things. So I guess we're, it's a little bit of a membership drive. Now, if I goof that up, Jacob, I apologize. And over the next week or two, I'll try to explain how one subscribes. Okay. All right. Communion again, um, I mentioned. We will celebrate that today. It is designed to be a part of our reflection on Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. And so that's why we bumped it to the second Sunday. In July, we will go back to having communion the first Sunday of the month. If we could share the wave of peace and Christ with each other, and make sure we wave at the camera so folks who are worshiping at home know that we know we're all together. Elizabeth? Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn this morning will be One Bread, One Body, located on page 620 for those of you worshiping at home. Please remain standing for the opening hymn.
be seated and join me in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of the heart by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord had commanded. Gather as much as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. Our second reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 78, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 24. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. In the sight of their ancestors who worked marvels in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan, he divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness, and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock, and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. 
They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness, even though he struck the rock so the water gushed out and torrents overflowed? Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of rage. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger mounted against Israel because they had no faith in God and they did not trust his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy Lord God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts assembled near and far, be acceptable unto you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Such a short verse within the Lord's Prayer. And yet so much to consider. In wrestling with Matthew 6, 11 this week, I was struck by a relationship, and so I'll name it at the beginning of our preaching time. And that is the relationship between God's provision for us and our ability to give. The relationship between God's provision for us and our ability to be generous and to think of others. It's been a rough year and a half, I know. And perhaps we're tired of coming to service and having the preacher talk about the pandemic. I don't want to do that in an inappropriate way, and yet there's so much to learn from the last year and a half, isn't there? One of my first experiences as we were heading into this time of pandemic and challenge and tragedy in March of 2020, one of my first experiences, the thing that made me really stop and think about it, to reflect, to consider what was at stake, revolved around this. Toilet paper. Do you remember those days? Cleaning products, too, and other things. There was a run on toilet paper. Now, I'll say this as delicately as I can. We all need it. It is an important thing. I'm not speaking against the significance of this sort of health and cleanliness, you know, product. But if you notice the collective psychology or sort of the group psychology in our country anyway, in March of 2020, people were hoarding, that term was used, toilet paper. What in the world is going on? Be easy to dismiss that as simply folks not thinking clearly, and, and it was that, or maybe some folks legitimately in need and others jumping on the bandwagon and then making it difficult for everyone else. We can look at it in many ways, but I look at the hoarding of toilet paper in the spring of 2020 as a massive sign of insecurity. Fear Fear, legitimate concern, blown out of proportion, and turned into an insecurity. And in that situation, what humanity 
often does, not always, but often does, is think about me, me, me. Thank God we've seen many acts of generosity and commitment. As I've said many times before and will continue to say, one of the things I've learned from our congregation is that through such difficult times, people can rise to the occasion and be so phenomenally caring and generous. And I've seen that, but let's be honest, on a bigger scale in our world, we saw a lot of selfishness driven by fear and insecurity. Toilet paper. Thanks, She's going to take that home because it's precious, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, garden. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, my. So Liz read for us from... Exodus 16, and I would like to shape my following remarks around three things. First of all, the story of Exodus 16 and the fear, insecurity, if you will, of the people of God following their release from Egypt, their demand for food. Secondly, let's look at Matthew 6:11 in the Lord's Prayer. What does it mean to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And finally, a reflection for a moment on the Lord's Supper. What is the relationship between all of these issues, our praying to God for provision, and the Lord's Supper? I think there is a relationship. Exodus 16, you see, is a chapter from the book of Exodus that comes between the time the people of God were led out of Egypt, but before the Ten Commandments are given. You with me? It's in that in-between time. And those are the times that often turn up in terms of um, fear, insecurity, not knowing where the whole story is going, right? The people of God, we've, we've all read this, I, I think, at least. And if you haven't, don't let me suggest there's something wrong if you, you know, Get into it. Earlier in Exodus, Moses confronts Pharaoh, and the people of God, the Israelites, are there as enslaved people. Building, 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 working, working, working in the hot sun. The old phrase, make more bricks, less straw. You know, being given more and more work to do, but less resources to help you do the work, more bricks, but less straw. That was their experience. And Moses, of course, is at the head of this community in leading them out through the Red Sea. And it's a time of great deliverance, right? And we may think that they all lived happily ever after from that moment, but we find out that after they're delivered, but before the Ten Commandments, <laughs> they have regrets. And they begin to mumble and murmur and complain and talk to Moses' brother Aaron and others that, you know, getting set free, if you will, from Egypt isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Look at this. We're supposedly free now, and we're out here in a desert, and we're going to die. You brought us out of Egypt, Moses, just to have us starve to death in the wilderness. That's the theme there, right? And some interesting dynamics take place, some sad dynamics from my perspective, because the arguments that the people used to say they were better off in Egypt are really twisted and sick. They begin to say things to Moses and Aaron like, well, if we would have stayed back there, at least we would have had enough to eat. The flesh pots of Egypt. And so in their minds, the people constructed this wonderful place in Egypt that maybe wasn't all that bad after all. Why did we have to leave it? Right? And they conveniently forgot to mention 
the horrible physical, mental, emotional, and I'm sure all kinds of other abuse they endured in Egypt. You get it? They created in their memory an idealized recollection of Egypt. Oh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, we had to work hard, but nothing wrong with hard work. Of course, there is nothing wrong with hard work, but in their case, it was slavery. But now they're hungry and they tell Moses they're angry. They want to go back. You with me? There's a phenomenon, and I'll step lightly here. I think we need to face it, but I want to do so sensitively, where people who are in abusive relationships and environments often go back. Somehow they convince themselves that it's better than nothing, or it's not all that bad, or it wasn't really that bad, or it wasn't really his fault or her fault or whatever, and this is a similar dynamic. In counseling, counseling they, they use that phrase, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know yet. In other words, so many people often choose to go back to a horrible situation because at least they're familiar with it and they're not sure what's coming ahead. It's a very, very, very difficult thing. We, we need to get some help, Bob. I'd say, yeah, let's, all righty. Well, I'm uh, able to continue with some teaching if you're game for it. And we do that in, not because we're uh, pretending that our sister isn't ill. Uh, we know that help's on the way and we'll keep you posted. So um, my thought about Exodus 16 is, is just that it's, it's human nature to react in fear when we don't know what the future holds and that sometimes we make decisions and do things that aren't for the best interest of ourselves or for the whole community, okay? And reacting in fear um, can be a dangerous thing. Everybody is afraid from time to time. I tell Liz that I was uh, afraid constantly for the better part of two decades <laughs> when my uh, late wife struggled with illness because uh, the, the, she, was, she would get very critically ill at a moment's notice and so I was always hyper vigilant. So I understand that. But in the case of the people leaving Egypt, they turned their fear into an anger and a blame against Moses and Aaron. And they began to create in their own minds this sense that they were better off back in Egypt. This is a hard lesson. And yet, the best part of the story, of course, is this. God provided for them. Did you get that? God gave the manna. God did not let them starve or die. He provided in the desert. He didn't provide because they complained loudly enough. God isn't one of those, uh, you know, people, so to speak, who reacts, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> God gave the manna because God loved the people. You with me? God provided one thing I've noticed, and I hesitated as to whether I should mention it today, but um, many of the television shows the, this day and age are, quite honestly, not very edifying, you know? <laughs> but, um, and I'm, you're probably aware of that show called Hoarders. I have mixed feelings about it because it is a, a television program that focuses on the life situation of someone who has collected so much stuff in his or her home that it becomes, you know, dangerous 
for many reasons, maybe in terms of not being sanitary, also not being safe in terms of other risks. And I struggle because I fear that if we're watching a television show, it could be a kind of exploitation. What I do notice in those television programs is usually the person who is struggling with hoarding has had a major, a significant and tragic loss in his or her life. The death of a loved one or something, and the person has reacted um, out of a sort of constant fear that life has taken so much away that he or she is going to cling to everything. I'm not sure that fits exactly, and I don't want to say it's a one-size-fits-all. But hoarding, grabbing is an act of desperation out of insecurity and fear. Okay? We don't know how bad this pandemic will be. I'm not sure what to do, but I can buy toilet paper. I know it sounds strange. Okay? Okay? And so how do we break out of that? How do we break out of that? Matthew chapter 6 tells us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Now that sounds simple, doesn't it? Are we thanking God for our, for our daily bread or the nourishment? Well, it's sort of a thanks, but more a petition asking. Well, what are we asking for? Are we asking for bread today? Daily bread? Gosh, I suppose that means my lunch and dinner on Sunday? I don't know. Okay? Scholars point to the fact that this may refer to tomorrow's bread. It's interesting how they come up with those things, looking at the words in Greek. It's not necessarily a prayer just for today, but for the short term, maybe even tomorrow. Give us daily bread, I'll put it that way. Okay? What kind of bread? What kind of bread? Is it the bread of our nourishment? Bread symbolic, and maybe you like a piece of chicken or a vegetable casserole or something, but the image of Bread being nourishment, is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about spiritual bread? I don't know, because Jesus respects all of that. And I'm inclined to say, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we are talking about the physical sustenance of daily nourishment, yes, Jesus never said that we're not bodily beings. But there's always something more, too, with Jesus, right? How we interpret and internalize God's provision for daily things has a spiritual impact. Has a spiritual impact. So move to reflection on communion with me. Soon we will pray the prayers of the communion liturgy, as we say. We remember the Lord's Supper, the first supper. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We remember all that God in Christ did for us. And yet we also do something else here, and yet sometimes may slip past us. But it's in the prayers, so look today now. We give thanks for God's provision through salvation, and we look forward to something called a heavenly banquet. Did you catch that language in the communion service? Until we feast with Christ in his heavenly banquet. What is that? The daily bread that we break unfortunately, using those little communion things for the time being. The daily bread is a sign of the practical nourishment that God gives to us today and tomorrow, but it also is a sign 
of the kingdom banquet, see? Because it's not just a modern phenomenon that people eat when they're having a nice party or reception, if we wish to use that word. Food, food is always a part of the imagery of celebration, you see? Not always, but I mean it's a very important part of celebration. When we break the bread and the body, we don't just look back, we look forward. That's what I'm saying. You with me? We do it in the context of trust that this is the God who will provide for us. Even when we're crabby and cranky, which never happens to me. Even when we think it was better off before than now. Even when we're tempted to go back to situations that aren't healthy or just. God says, I've got this. I'll provide for you. See? Physically, in terms of nourishment, but also spiritually. And when we take the bread and drink the cup, we're remembering the past, right? We have the whole prayers about what Jesus did for us. But we're also looking forward to the future. And we're saying there's going to come a day when this little, pardon me, piece of cardboard tasting flat, stale, whatever it is, waferish thing, Go with the contrast. There's going to come a day when that becomes a real heavenly feast in the kingdom. So we're looking forward. And we're doing it because we trust God's provision. So there's a lot when we say, give us this day our daily bread. We are asking for sustenance, physical nourishment, but we're also stepping into a reality that is out ahead. He's going to provide. And I mean to tell you, someday he's going to provide like we can't even imagine. And that is a spiritual reality. It is also a physical reality in that someday I have to believe everybody who needs food in the world is going to have food. See, they're connected. But that doesn't happen if we react out of insecurity and fear. I don't know what's coming, and so I'm going to hoard whatever I can get. So. I'll close with this. Some years ago, uh, a group of friends in our denomination took a trip to India. And it was a trip where they were attempting to combine uh, some learning for themselves. They felt they needed to learn about another place and culture. They needed to learn that, but they also wanted to help a bit. You know, that, that tough balance. Not just going somewhere as people of privilege and not helping, but also being honest that in that moment they could probably help a little bit, but not as much as they would like to. You with me? That's kind of a tough struggle in trying to help folks. And so this team of missionaries went to India, and one day, as I was told, one day a few of them went to visit a family and they wanted to at least share some token, token of care and concern, okay? And so they took a bag of rice. They knew it was not going to solve the problem of hunger with that family. They knew it was not everything that the people needed, but they didn't just want to stop by without taking something to help. And so these few people were invited into this home that was a very humble place and met for a few moments with a family that was in such tremendous need. And awkwardly, uh, one of the people visiting pulled the bag of rice and said, we, we know it's not a lot, but we wanted to at least bring something for you. And after a moment of awkwardness, 
the person who was the head of the family in that household said, excuse me just a minute. Everybody stop. The person, she opened the bag of rice. She went and got a container and poured half of the contents, half, into another container. And she said, if you'll excuse me, I want to run next door to my neighbors because they are hungry too. And she took half of that modest gift to her neighbors. You see, when I began the time of preaching, I said, I believe there is a relationship between God's provision for us and our generosity. These folks trusted in God's provision in a way that convicts me with all of my opulence and my wealth. And when they trusted, they didn't just say, I'm blessed. They said, excuse me, I need to share this. You with me? How contrary, how opposite from this hoarding mentality. All of the rolls of toilet paper in the world are not going to make one secure in a physical sense or a spiritual sense. And there's nothing wrong with having adequate toilet paper. So just remember, think along with me, the nature of God's provision for us. Not that we don't work, we'll work, work is good, but the way in which God provides. Because if we remember that God will provide, then we are able to share. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll share with you uh, some prayer concerns. Of course, we want to keep Harriet in our prayers. We'll give a moment for our some moments. Before the end of the service, I'll try to share with you what we know about how Harriet's doing. Harvey Ross had surgery last Thursday. Um, he was home and he was doing better and then early last week he became ill again and so went to the hospital in South Bend and did have surgery and it went very well. We're hoping that this is the you know, this is the thing that will really help him for the long run recover. So we're, we're thankful, even though we regret Harvey had to go through that, but uh, we'll pray for him and Janet. Leon Leyland has been ill this week um, and yet has received some treatment and we're hoping is able to feel better in the time to come. Bernie Lehman has been down and um, with an infection and under doctor's care, and we hope feeling better. Uh, we want to keep John and Joanne Barnhart in our prayers. I've been told that Lillian Shepherd, this is the sister of Marilyn Archer. Marilyn is one of our um, co-workers at Action Ministries. Her sister, Lillian, had significant surgery, brain surgery, so we want to pray for Lillian. And Barb shared with me that Michael Franks is in need of our prayers. Um, they are in Nevada? Okay. And uh, Michael has been having some respiratory troubles and maybe some pretty serious ones. We're not exactly sure. So... Oh, okay, they were just visiting Nevada. Okay, oh boy. Well, we hope he gets home and, and has the kind of care that will help him feel better. And then Katie Silvernail, uh, Harvey and Janet Ross's daughter, Katie, she has a friend named Jenny who's going through a really tough time, so we want to just remember Jenny, okay? Okay. I almost forgot. 
I know, I found the note. Wendy shared with us um, that Denise Swartz, who is a beloved teacher at the high school here in Dwajak, has had uh, some serious blood pressure issues, and it seems that she's had a series of some um, small, I guess, small, yeah, I hate to say small strokes, but, you know, this, okay, it's, it's a very serious issue, and we're concerned about her, so we want to keep Denise. Let's pray. We will not pray the Lord's Prayer until we move over to communion. So I'll offer a short prayer, and then we are also going to share after that. Kathy, would that be okay? The, prayer, the quilt for Harvey. Trying to keep everything together. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks that you are a God who provides. When we are scared, when we are frightened, Lord, remind us of your presence. When we seek our own solution, Lord, remind us that you are there to support us. Give us hearts of confidence and generosity, Lord, trusting that you are the one who will give us daily bread. For those who are ill, Lord, we ask your abiding presence. For those who face questions of surgery or medical care, please be with them. Move among us, Lord, that we may be signs of the kingdom, serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm coming, Kathy. Am I okay to use, thanks, folks, the microphone here. For some time, Kathy can tell us at some point, <laughs> Kathy Hall has been making quilts that we're call, we call prayer quilts. And so every now and then, and uh, there's no hard and fast rule. We want to be generous and loving about this. Uh, folks who might be having a particularly tough time receive the quilt, and we, in a way, dedicate it or we pray in the service, and then we make sure that we get the quilt to the person. It's another example, really. I don't want to go off on this, but it's another example of something very practical and tangible like bread and juice having a spiritual meaning and power. So, um, did I capture that okay, Kathy? You did good. Okay, I don't want to cut you off. You're the artist that has been helping us with this, along with some other folks. And so what I have done is I have a prayer of um, dedication that is a sort of prayer for healing, and then we have a copy of that prayer that we give to the person um, we're gifting. So Harvey... It will be prayed for now, and then we will give him this prayer to remind him of our love and of God's power. Let's pray. Almighty God, we pray that Harvey may be comforted in his suffering and made whole. When he is afraid, give him courage. When he feels weak, grant him your strength. When he is afflicted, afford him patience. When he is lost, offer him hope. When he is alone, move us to his side. Almighty and everlasting God, show forth your power that by your mercy, Harvey may know your love and find himself renewed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Thank you, Kathy. I will put the prayer near the quilt so that following service will get it to, to Harvey. Maybe that might work. Okay. Back to you. Now is the time to return some of what we have been given. The ushers will bring the offering forward during the doxology.
please stand for the doxology? Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all of our days into a living sacrifice to you. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. invite you to turn to, well, no, we're using uh, the screen with the prayers. I'm a creature of habit as well. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to thank Marsha Butts, who uh, sets the table for us every Communion Sunday. So uh, thank you to Marsha. She puts things out and cleans things up, and it's a real help to us. It's uh, a holy time and it's also a time that can be messy, and that's okay. And it's nice to have brothers and sisters um, caring for that. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, 
one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now I invite us to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, give me thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the gifts of God for all of us, the people of God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the body of Christ broken for you. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the blood of Christ shed for you. Our closing hymn today will be Break Through the Bread of Life, found on page 599 for those of you worshiping at home. Please <clears throat> remain standing for our closing hymn. I don't have a particular update on how Harriet is feeling right now, but we trust she's in uh, good care, and I'd like to express appreciation for those who turned to and, and helped her get the care. So we'll keep praying for Harriet. Go now in the knowledge and love of God, the Father Almighty, in the grace of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.